Hello, my name is Grace Little, and welcome to my presentation on the effect of age on life impact factors assessed using the Hypomania Checklist 32R1. This presentation was presented as part of a dissemination symposium um, at APA 2022 um, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we've recorded it here for your viewing pleasure. So a little bit about me, I am a post-baccalaureate researcher broadly interested in assessment research and parent-child dyads. Um, so my wheelhouse is more um, developmental um, in some ways. I'm currently a research assistant at the Brain and Early Experiences Lab at UNC Chapel Hill, and I'm also a volunteer research assistant for the Research Addressing Violence in Education Lab or RAVE Lab, also at UNC. Um, but I'm here in the capacity as a volunteer RA with helping give away psychological science. So a little bit about where we're going today. We're gonna to discuss um, briefly hypomania in clinical settings. We're gonna talk about the specific assessment that is used um, in these analyses, and then discuss the data and methodology and key results and limitations. And here's a chance for you guys to scan this handy dandy QR code so that you can have access to our team's OSF page, which will have a copy of the measure and the R code um, if you want to check it out. All right, so first up talking about hypomania in clinical settings. Often, um, you know, we have a few common things that you'll see as a clinician. So think anxiety and depression. This may be on the less common side, but it's still very important to screen for. Um, this being bipolar two and cyclothymia, you know, those may be a lesser known um, psychopathology. So broadly speaking, mood symptoms are among the most frequently cited reasons for pursuing clinical mental health services and hypomania can mirror other common mood symptoms or be mistaken for MDD um, in clinical settings. And this is because Mood symptoms can manifest differently across different populations. So that includes across the lifespan, hormones are shifting um, in puberty. And then again, later in life, bipolar rates do increase with the onset of puberty and then hypomania and mania rates broadly decrease later in life. So a little bit about mood symptoms across the lifespan. Both major depression and mania are most commonly experienced during early adulthood. We see those like you know, shifting brain chemistry, continuing development, and mood symptoms in the prevalence of mania tend to decrease with age, shifting more towards depression. So these risks are essentially going in opposite directions, as you see illustrated by this arrow up here, going depression risk increasing with age and mania risk decreasing as age progresses. And often clients may not choose to disclose to their therapist or be aware of hypomanic symptoms. So clinicians need to screen for hypomania and mixed states as well as depressive and anxious states. And this may be because maybe they aren't aware of the negative impacts of hypomania on their life or they don't trust the therapist yet to disclose these things. They might not be in a state where they yet know that they why they need help, they just know that they do. So kind of thinking about using an evidence-based assessment model in practice, you're always going off time versus detail in practice. You don't always have time for that lengthy interview to assess, oh, does someone, is, are they exhibiting hypomanic states? You wanna check, you have this screening tool that you may use if there's a concern that there is something other than depressive state or an anxious state under the surface. And so consequences of misdiagnosis of bipolar II disorder include poor mental health and physical health outcomes and second order life factor impacts such as social work and family impacts. Those may be something along the lines of, I feel fine, but you know, my family saying something's off, my work colleagues are saying something's off. There's a perceived kind of social impact that is reflected in these um, states when they're not addressed. 
So enter the hypomania checklist 32R1. This is the um, kind of second tier assessment we would be talking about. So thinking about maybe you've used your usual screening battery um, and you've determined that there is a problem, but it's not getting flagged on the other things that are available for your use. So you enter with this assessment just to screen for hypomanic states. A little bit about the hypomania checklist. It's a self-administered survey comprised of 32 primary items across two dimensions. These dimensions are active elated or sunny and irritable risk-taking or dark. And it was created by Jules Angst and colleagues circa 2005. It is an older version um, of than is what is most currently out, but this version is um, free to use in clinical settings. So these primary items feature I statements, which are either endorsed or not endorsed by the client when they're taking it. And there's a picture of Jules Zonks for, for you. All right. So the HCL32 has great discriminative ability for bipolar two versus major depressive disorder comparable to the MDQ, which is sort of the gold standard for EBA, um, and it's also widely validated and translated into over 30 languages. So if you are a clinician that works with a population that doesn't necessarily speak English, you can rest assured that there are different um, versions of this assessment that have been validated in other languages. So as I mentioned before, this version is free to use in clinical settings. So at the end of this presentation today, if you decide that you would like to use it in your practice, you can use that QR code and grab um, the screener off of our OSF. So this is a, um, in addition to the primary 32 items, the HCL32 also has a section for looking at um, kind of addressing those second order life factor impacts, um, including perceived reaction to highs. This is like the reaction of others two highs reported by the client. So it's a self-report, like how are other people or how do I think other people are viewing me or my work or, you know, my whatever's going on in my life when I'm in these um, manic or high states. So thinking about other people's reaction, they can rate um, that perceived social reaction either positively neutrally, negatively, um, both positively and negatively, or no reaction. And this screenshot was a grab from the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance, which houses this online screening center um, I'll address later in our discussion. And then again, another question addressing those second order life factor impacts. So the impact of your highs on various aspects of your life. And this includes dimensions of family life, social life, work life, and leisure. These can be rated either positively and negatively, positively, negatively, or no impact reported. And this kind of just flags, um, helps flag some areas of concern that might be going on if you do use this screener. So if you don't explicitly ask about, you know, work life, you may not catch a flag that's up and waving. Um, that's why using checklists is kind of, you know, a good path. And, EBA because time versus detail, not a lot of time investment, but you can very easily flag something if it's there. And again, one more chance to grab that QR code so that you can have a copy of the assessment and a copy of these slides, as well as the R code used for these analyses. So our data and methodology. The HCL32 is psychometrically validated in many languages, but Yes, and we know that biology changes with age as well as risk factors and perceived impacts. So we wanted to look at kind of a more um, specific groupings of like, where do these shifts for risk and perceived um, life order impacts kind of fall across the lifespan? Are these um, age and mania and depression risks, like how are they on a five-year or a 10-year gap evolving and changing? And are people reporting differently based on the age that they are at? So kind of looking at in clinical settings, or in this case, we're extrapolating to 
you know, what would happen in a clinical setting. Who is reporting versus not reporting these symptoms or who's reporting, you know, fewer negative impacts, fewer positive impacts, more negative impacts in their life um, so that we can think about populations that may be more or less at risk or, you know, more or less, it might be more or less favorable to use this assessment for those populations in your clinical practice. So the current study is a secondary analysis of perceived social response and life impact dimensions by these age groupings that I mentioned. All these data were collected um, using an online mental health screening center housed on the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance um, website, dbsaalliance.org. And they were collected in cooperation with Helping Giveaway Psychological Science. So these, um, this mental health screening center houses a lot of free um, assessments for use for screening for depression, anxiety, um, child mania, and hypomania, of course, as well as um, several other groupings of topics that you might see in your, your practice. So it's definitely a great resource to have on hand um, if you're looking for additional assessments to add to your um, tool belt. So the methodology, we used an open source teaching methodology for this um, project. And essentially that means that most of the analyses were done by researchers who don't necessarily have a um, graduate degree or in graduate programming, but they were closely supervised um, by the investigators of helping give away psychological science and um, all of the materials and workspaces that we used were open source. So those include the open science framework, RStudio, which is an open source programming language, and then the results will be published on Wikiversity along with um, this talk and some write-ups about it. So all of our materials are freely accessible um, and we just ask that you credit us. So the analyses, as I mentioned, conducted in our studio and all of our materials are housed on these open suite platforms and all of the work and communication was um, done in Google Suites. So a little bit about our demographic data, the age range of these respondents um, was from 15 years old to 88 years old from those who reported their age. Um, and we've broadly broken down these groupings into late adolescence, early adulthood, middle adulthood, and midlife and later life. So like I said, taking a kind of a more um, specific view of these age groupings. So groups of like five years or 10 years so that we can really see when those life changes are happening. And those our N was 8,800 and 23 after our data cleaning. And for the gender breakdown of our data, the number of respondents we had um, skewed heavily female at about a three to one um, ratio. We also had a healthy um, subset of our data that included transgender respondents. Um, unfortunately, the breakdown is not cis female, cis male, trans female, trans male, or non binary. Um, it does group the transgender um, respondents into one group. So that's definitely something to look at for later analyses or iterations of this um, screening tool. And then there were also 1.4-ish percent um, of respondents who preferred not to disclose their gender identity. Some key results from our analyses. So we did find that there was a strong association between age group and others reaction to highs with respondents aged 20 to 24, so that early adulthood sect reporting negative reactions with much lower frequency than expected. There was also um, a perceived social impact. We saw that this varied significantly by age groups, indicating especially decreased frequency, so fewer than expected um, in negative social impact reported among that same age group. Um, respondents aged 20 to 24. So we can look at those, those first two key results and think, okay, there's definitely something going on with that early adulthood population. It seems like they're reporting negative responses with a lower frequency and reporting negative social impact at a lower frequency. This doesn't quite, you know, jive with what we know about um, 
life changes and vulnerability and risk to mania and hypomania and depression. So we would expect that that age group would be kind of dealing with those new manifestations of hypomania at greater frequencies than um, other age groups. So the fact that they're indicating that it's fewer, that's something to think, think about. And then our last key result, we saw that respondents age 45 plus, so that mid to late life, were significantly more likely to report none or negative social impact than um, other age groups that we found. So here's a mosaic plot of some of these um, analyses. We see that respondent age and reaction to high here. Um, I'll orient you to our hot and cold cells. So when you see that red cell, it means significantly fewer than um, expected. And when you see a blue cell, it means significantly greater than expected, not necessarily an indication of severity of responses. So here we have this circle. This is what I described, the especially decreased frequency in that late adolescence, early adulthood sphere for um, reporting negative um, reactions from others to their highs, which is not something that we would expect. And so here on the second mosaic plot, we have respondent age by social impact. Again, we're seeing that especially decreased frequency with them reporting um, both positive and negative impacts as well as no impact. And then here in the midlife um, section and later life sections, we're seeing increased frequency in that positive and negative reporting or reporting no impact. So that's specifically along the social impact dimension, the idea that um, you know, they're reporting with greater frequency, this positive and negative or no impact socially. And I'll, again, also up here, we have the late adolescence reporting a little bit increased frequency, that negative social impact here. All right, so these findings are a little surprising for the reasons that I mentioned above, though they are broadly consistent with mood symptom research across age groups. We see that younger respondents, as I mentioned, may not be reporting these negative impacts in clinical settings. So that's why it becomes super important to think about um, assessing in these populations, as well as respondents later in life reporting these negative social impacts with greater frequency. We can think about, you know, sometimes our um, clients in later life, even though they have this depression risk that has gone up with age, there still may be respondents who have hypomanic symptoms or have gone undiagnosed that are flying under our radar that we need to be considerate about. So our key takeaways is that bipolar two can often be misdiagnosed as MDD and clinicians will need to screen for hypomania in clients with these risk factors. And we need to think about kind of the overall timeline, past and present. Um, that HCL32 asks um, respondents to recall a time when they did have a high episode. So that's like thinking about mania and hypomania. Um, and if they can't recall those, then most of the assessment is um, maybe a moot point or at least those life factor dimensions. But that's a big, um, big flag when screening for things like bipolar disorder. So you want to think about not only the history that the client is bringing in with them, but also how they're presenting in their current state, but really emphasizing that history component. So have they ever had a manic state? And then again, the HCL32 is a free to use measure. It's been widely validated and has great discriminative ability for hypomania and major depressive disorders. So it can tell the two apart. And the age of the client can often change their perception of their life impacts. You know, you're not always going to get the young to late teenager coming in saying, I'm hypomanic, you know, this is what I need, X, Y, Z. They might not perceive that their um, hypomania is negative. They may feel more energized. They may feel like they can do anything, you know, but we want to kind of assess those, those respondents and have treatment goals in mind the HCL32 does offer a quick and accessible way to screen clients for these mood symptoms um, in addition to your kind of standard assessment battery. So our discussion and limitations. 
The Age Shield 32, you know you wanna use it, right? It's a free assessment, it takes almost no time to administer, zero minutes added to kind of the in-office time and experience. It can be electronically administered or sent over email. And as I mentioned before, um, it's super useful because we do know that the effect of hypomania can be perceived differently by clients versus clinicians, especially across the lifespan. And we do need to screen for hypomania in clients with these risk factors, not just for their presenting states, but their past states as well. The HDL32 offers insight to both the positive and negative impacts of hypomania, and it's the only hypomania measure that does this. So as I mentioned, you may have a presenting client that doesn't have negative feelings about their um, previous um, experiences of manic states. So you wanna make sure you're really getting into that, um, you know, maybe the positive dimensions that they're experiencing hypomania. And then again, the HL32 is accessible, quick to administer and free to use. So the limitations of this study is that it was a secondary analysis. Um, these data were not collected for this purpose. And as well, it's a non-clinical sample with no diagnostic interview and follow-up. There are limited options for reporting gender in the screening tool that we use on the, the Depression and Bipolar Support Alliance website. Um, so that's something to look at having a greater breakdown in the future. Um, future directions for these analyses would include, like I said, further breakdown of these age groups, um, these age analyses by gender groups, and then as well, I would love to get a new sample paired with some diagnostic data so we could confirm some of these um, respondents' screening scores, and then again, additional options for reporting gender on that transgender question, and we could potentially update the database or the, the screening tool to have um, the HCL 33, which is a more recent version of the assessment. All right, and last but not least, I wanna say thank you to the HGABS team that I worked with and Dr. Youngstrom for collaborating on these analyses. You can contact me via email at littlegr at unc.edu or gracelittle8 at gmail.com. If you have any questions and one more chance for you to grab that QR code to get the analyses um, and the R code and a version of the screen tool. So thank you so much and I hope to hear from you soon.